When I was in New Zealand, when I arrived there, the first thing I said to myself was what it took my parents to pay for my studies, and I know what they're going through, and I know it's not easy, and I told myself that I will never fail, and I will not just fail, but I will do my best in what I'm doing. Hi everyone and welcome to episode number 36 of the Immigrants Life podcast, where we share stories of people who left their country to chase a better life. And through these stories, you can find ideas, resources and motivation to do the same. If English is your second language and you have difficulty understanding the conversation, you can find the transcript of the full episode in the show notes at immigrantslife.com slash episode 36. I'm Daniel De Biasi, and my guest this week is a software engineer from Nigeria, who studied in New Zealand and now lives in France. The way he managed to leave his country is fascinating because he felt so lucky to have the chance to study abroad, he kept pushing himself and achieving new goals. One of his last achievements was getting accepted into Oxford University, where he's finishing his master in computer science while working full time. Before moving to my conversation with Mo, make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. It would be great if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And now, without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mo. Hey Mo, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for having me. No worries. It's my pleasure having you on the podcast. I had to thank Isaac, our f- common friends in New Zealand, to introduce each other. And yeah, let's, let's start with your story. Uh, where are you generally from? I'm originally from Nigeria. Okay. And where do you live now? I currently live in Paris, France. And let's start from the beginning because you, as I said, you were born in Nigeria and then you moved to New Zealand, you studied in New Zealand, and then you moved with your wife to Paris. So I'd like to say, why did you leave your country? So I was studying in Nigeria. I started studying computer science because I wanted to learn how to write software. And I wanted to be able to actually practice doing that. But then in my university in Nigeria, three years into my studies, I realized that I never touched a computer as part of that program. And that made me realize that, okay, I've got a four-year program to study computer science. Three years in, I've never touched a computer. So I talked to my parents and asked them if there's a possibility to sponsor me to go overseas to further my studies, where I'll be able to acquire those skills that I require. They kind of hesitated because of the financial situation, but they agreed that, yep, they will support me with whatever they can. And that was what led me to leave Nigeria. So you were studying computer science. You did you have computer school? We had computers at the university. However, one issue was a lot of people were like lots of the computers were broken. That's one thing. Most of the time there was no electricity to use the computers. And for some reason, we don't actually practice um, using the computers. So even the programming classes that we took were just on the board, like with some chalk yeah, and on paper. Why did you decide to, to study computer? Did you have a, a computer at home? Why did you turn into computer science? I came across um, a computer when I was quite young. We were taken on an excursion at school. So we go on these field trips and I saw a computer then. And since then, even though I didn't touch it, I was fascinated by it. And then at some point, like we had the Symbian phones. So it's like um, a mobile phone before the smartphones. And I used to play with the operating system and move files and try to do different things. And I've kind of been fascinated about computers and things, um, software related things since then. And yeah, that was why I decided, yep, I'd love to do it. So you decided to leave Nigeria mainly for a better education in computer science. What age did you leave your country? I was 21 years old when I initially left um, the country in 2007. I lived the country and you went to New Zealand or you went to, to, to somewhere else first? So what's happened was I originally applied to go and study in the US. 
and I got admitted. I got my I-20 applied to the U.S. Embassy for a student visa. And I was denied a student visa. They gave me a reason that I needed to prove that my visit to the U.S. will be a temporary visit. And I will return back to my home country after the completion of my studies, which I provided all documents for, but I got denied. So that led me to go to Egypt because I already left my university in Nigeria. And while I was in Egypt, I reapplied to the U.S. again for visa. I was denied again. And after I finished my studies in Egypt, which was also computer related, specifically in computer networking, I met a friend there in Egypt who applied to go and study in New Zealand. And he told me about New Zealand and how great it is. And I thought, okay, I'll apply to the same university where he was going to study. And I told my parents about it and they said, yeah, we'll see what we can do. And yeah, that's how I ended up in New Zealand later on. It's crazy though that US rejected your application because they wanted to go back to your country after all. It's the completely opposite here in Canada. You want to apply for a visa. They wanted to prove that you're going to stay in the country because they invest, I don't know, money or resources to teach you something, especially a computer skill, like a US, it's such a big country for technology and they teach you all these skills and they want you to go back to your country. That's for me, that's crazy. <laughs> I know. And maybe this question might be a little bit personal and feel free to no answer if you feel like it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but to go and study abroad, it's quite expensive. How do you manage to study in New Zealand? I was lucky. I think that's the short answer to that. To give you a long version of the answer. So my parents had a small restaurant that they were running. And at that time, to be honest, just before I went to New Zealand, wasn't something that they could afford. So to go and study in New Zealand. And around that time, their business like picked up quite well. But in addition to that, there was this spaghetti company called Dangote that had a promo going on, a millionaire promo. And the worth of that promo, the value rather was worth about $10,000 US dollars at that time, equivalent uh, of Naira. So my mom, like we started packaging, like putting applications down for the promo and we send them to the company and we won a million Naira. And that's coincidence, that's crazy, <laughs> unbelievable story. Basically was one of the main reasons I was able to afford the first year at least in New Zealand. Oh, wow. That's such a crazy story. And did you have like a plan B or like a plan A if you didn't get this money? What was your plan before winning this money to go to New Zealand to move abroad? I already said goodbye to my friends in Nigeria and the university and my study in Egypt was just a temporary one. So I didn't really have a plan B other than going back to my university in Nigeria and telling people that, well, it didn't work out. <laughs> I'm back again. Oh, okay. So that was really <laughs> lucky that your mom won this kind of lottery. Oh uh, yeah, that was super lucky. And going forward a little bit, so you went to New Zealand, you graduated in university in New Zealand. So you did another master in New Zealand after university. And also, this is like crazy that you actually got into Oxford in the UK. So I guess you are like a really good student. Yeah, well, when I was in New Zealand, when I arrived there, the first thing I said to myself was what it took my parents to pay for my studies. And I know what they're going through. And I know it's not easy. And I told myself that I will never fail and I will not just fail, but I'll do my best in what I'm doing. And ever since then, I've been a good student. I was the best student when I did my um, undergraduates at Lincoln University in New Zealand. And my first master's as well, I was, um, I had a very good grade. So when I saw the opportunity to apply to Oxford, I knew it was the best university in the world, at least according to the ranking then, I thought I'll give it a try. I may not get in, but it wouldn't cost me anything if I try and I don't make it. And yeah, to my surprise, I got in, which was uh, pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. So you feel like this pressure 
to doing well in life because your family sacrificed quite a lot, especially financially, to give you a good education. Absolutely. I guess that's a really good drive to, <laughs> to push in life and do the best of your life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you, with the money that your mom won through this lottery, you managed to go through the first year of university in New Zealand. How did you manage to do the other years? Did you work over there or how was the process for you to continue studying in New Zealand? So it was a combination of things. Like you mentioned, I worked there partly. So while I was at the university, my department gave me a role and they gave me a job to teach, to help like tutor the students from like the previous year. So because I was already in the second year then, so the newer students I was helping and their tutoring. So that helped. I was also working, doing some supermarket job and pizza delivery. And in addition to that, my parents' business as well was doing relatively well. Although in my subsequent years of studies, Quite often, I paid my school fees a bit later than I was supposed to because it was a bit difficult to meet the like deadline requirement. But yeah, we managed through and yep, I was able to finish successfully. For the listener, maybe they want to do the same thing. Can you share the number, how much roughly cost to, to study in New Zealand, at least in the university you went to? Yes, sure. So in 2009, um, when I got there, it costs uh, 20,000 New Zealand dollars at Lincoln University, the annual school fees. And at that time, when you convert it to US dollar, it was just around, I think, 13,000 or 11,000 US dollars at that time. So that's just for the school fees. And then in addition to that, you had to pay um, accommodation fees and then the feeding um, cost. So over three years period, so it's just the study, cost about 60,000 New Zealand dollars. And then in addition to that, the accommodation and feeding cost. So overall, I think I'll roughly say about 100,000 New Zealand dollars really. Wow. Over that period of time. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of money. It is. Definitely. Looking back now, it is a lot of money. And yeah, it's unbelievable that I was able to afford that really. Yeah, especially coming from Nigeria. It's not one of the richest country in the world. No, especially from the parts where I came from, in, even in Nigeria, it's arguably one of the poorest parts of the country, if not the poorest. Yeah, because there's not many people that can leave the, their country, they can leave Nigeria, right? Or is that common yeah. for people leaving? A lot of people live, especially people in the southern part of the country, but not from the place where I was born and where I grew up, which is in the northern part of the country. Okay. And do you have any regrets about leaving Nigeria? I wish I did not have to in the first place. I wish there were, you know, the resources were there, the education was sufficient and I was able to contribute to the system. But looking back now, I, I don't regret, to be honest, living other than my family and friends that have still been there, uh, missing them. But other than that, no, not really. And do you think you will move back to Nigeria at some point in life or you think your life is going to be away from your home country? It is a tough question to answer, to be honest, at this point. I will still love to contribute to its development, really, given my, like, some of the skills, the experiences I've acquired over the past couple of years. I would definitely love to go back to contribute whether it's permanently or not that's i haven't decided yet fair enough you're still pretty young how old are you now um, i'm 35 still pretty young to make a, such a decision but some people know exactly just i want to study abroad or whatever and then i won't go back to my country because i miss my country and I, that's where I, I can see my life some people like me is no way <laughs> i'm never gonna go back to italy or my country i, I can't see my life there anymore Going back to your story, so you were in New Zealand, you got accepted into Oxford, and that's in the UK. So how did you end up in, in Paris? That's a very good question. So when I was in New Zealand, while I was still studying, doing my undergraduate degree, my wife came from France as an exchange student to do a semester in New Zealand. And we happened to be in the same halls of residence at that time. So that was how we met. And then she had to go back to France, but then she decided after her studies to come back to New Zealand and started working. And 
we started going out together at that time. So basically we got married and we got kids. And then when I decided to apply to study at Oxford and surprisingly got accepted, uh, we decided that rather than traveling all the way from New Zealand back to the UK and back to New Zealand again, it will be easier to live somewhere closer to Oxford in the UK. So given that she's French, we decided to move to France and base ourselves in Paris. And that also led me to apply for a job in Paris. And yeah. Okay, so you were commuting from England to Paris? Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, wow. Every couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's like, it's not too far. It's not like New Zealand, but still it's at least a few hours to either drive or flight. I don't know how you will get there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I was basically taking Eurostar, which is a train that goes directly from Paris to London. And then once I get to London, I take either another train to Oxford for about an hour or I take the bus back and forth. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you would go for how long would you stay in uh, in England? So whenever I go there, I stay for at least a week. Also. Okay, so that means you'll be able to follow some courses and do some classes uh, online? Yes. So one of the things that COVID helped me with, I was able to do a significant part of it online because of the requirements, because we couldn't travel and we couldn't um, be physically present in the classes. So that's helped a lot. But Yes, other than that, I would have had to be there physically quite a lot. And in your experience, in your journey, what was the biggest challenge that you had to face? Um, I think going to New Zealand, when I got to New Zealand and realizing that my peers, so the other students that I was in the same class with, that they were so much more advanced, they were so much more used to some of the things that we were being taught than I was. And realizing that I needed to do twice as much as them to be able to catch up with them. And in addition to that, after I completed my studies and trying to get a job in New Zealand, um, realizing that, yes, even though we finished at the same university, when I started working, realizing that I needed to work almost twice as much as like my colleagues to be able to prove myself, to sh prove that, yes, I can do it as well. So I think those are some of the, the biggest challenges I've faced in my life so far. Yes, because you came from, from Nigeria and you said you couldn't even like a, use a computer at school. So you were competing with people that probably grew up with computers. They had a like laptop and computers like in the house and they can use it anytime they want. And then for you, maybe it was like a little bit more challenging to figure out how everything works. Oh, definitely. It was challenging for me. It was very challenging. I had to do a lot more, as you can imagine, and as you mentioned it as well. And going back to what you say about the finding a job and proving yourself uh, you were as good as other, other people, if not better. Was that because you were an immigrant or was that because the, the color of your skin? I think it's both, but I also felt because of the color of my skin. New Zealand compared to, I guess, a lot of other Western countries doesn't have as many black immigrants. So I felt like all the companies I worked at pretty much, I believe I was the only black African, like in the offices at least that I worked in. So I always had this feeling that people may look down on me or feel I'm not as capable enough. And as a result of that, I've always tried to push myself to deliver good quality work, to do things as properly as I can. Was this part of who you are one of the drives that, that pushes you to, to get more qualification and certificates and more education in your fields just because you want to prove to others that you actually know your stuff? Um, yeah, definitely. I, I think that's part of it. Okay. Now I'll ask you that question because I was in the same situation or like a similar situation when I moved to New Zealand because I couldn't speak the language. I couldn't prove to other people. I couldn't show the other people that I knew about the field. I knew about how to do the job. I didn't know how to express myself. So for me, a way to prove to other people that I wasn't, uh, air quote, stupid was to get qualification. Then I start studying, get qualification over qualification. I think I landed my first job just because I got like a qualification in uh, computer networking. Even though I didn't need the qualification to get a job, I needed it for myself. 
to, I don't know, think of that I was uh, good enough to apply for that job. I probably would have got it anyway, but I needed that qualification to prove to myself that I could apply for the job. I was good enough for the job. That's why I was asking that question. No, definitely. You're right. It's the same thing. And I, I think it's helps, at least in my experience, it always helps because it's a self reassurance that yes, um, I can do it. I, I can give it a try. I tried it and I did it. I got it. And I know that, okay, I can go, I can take the next step and see, try to achieve the next challenge and turn. Yeah, you achieved quite a bit, all right? Did you finish your master at Oxford or you're still doing it? So it should be finished this year. So basically now we are going through my thesis and finalizing that at this point. Yeah, even just going to that point, it's first of all, they don't let anybody get into Oxford. You need to be a pretty good student. You need to prove that you got what it takes to get into the school. But even then finish it, yeah, it needs uh, a lot of effort. And also you, you say you had to find a job in Paris. So you were actually working while you were studying as well. Yes, that's right. So going back to what you mentioned about Oxford, like getting in, I remember when I was in Canterbury University, no, rather when I went back to Canterbury University to get my transcript, because to apply to Oxford, I needed to provide that. And I had a very good grade. So I went to the admission department and talked to them about getting my transcript. And the guy asked me, oh, so what do I want to use it for? Because I asked him to translate it to a UK standard, so the equivalent grade. And I told him that, oh, I'm applying to Oxford University. And the guy like looked at me suspiciously, like, <laughs> you think you'll get into Oxford? And, you know, I just ignored him and like just kept quiet and let him do the stuff for me. After I got accepted... The first thing I thought about that guy that, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I felt I, I wish I could go back to him and tell him that, hey, this is my admission letter. I've been accepted into Oxford. And uh, back to your second question about studying while also working. Yes, I have kids. I have two daughters. I was working in France full time and I was using my leaves basically to go to Oxford in addition to taking unpaid leaves as well. So yeah, it was quite a lot, but I felt it's something that I needed to do and be done with. So why did you feel like uh, you have to finish Oxford? I know it's a huge privilege to be into the school. But do you have like, I don't know, because at some point maybe if like, okay, I have, a, I have a family, I can spend time with my family, I have a job that pays the bills. Why would I have to continue doing this, uh, this sacrifice? What was the reason why you kept doing it? Um, I felt I, w I needed to have something that it's not just valuable in New Zealand or something that is not just recognized in New Zealand, something that when I get it, wherever I go to in the world, people will be able to say that, yes, okay, this, this is an attestation that, yes, you are capable of doing it and you've obviously done it. And also, as I mentioned earlier, I've always wanted to advance myself. So even at home, like when I'm reading books, I'm not into fictional books. I love like non-fictional books, learning about things, um, whether they're in my field or not in my field. So I, I just enjoy advancing myself. And that's one of the things that I felt Oxford will give me an opportunity to be able to get. And it has given me, it has expanded my mind beyond anywhere I've ever thought it would. So... Yeah, I think it was really worth it. Yeah, no, it makes totally sense. It may be even like the people that you met, the network that you create going like through this university is just such a privilege, right? Uh, absolutely. And speaking about reading books, I can see behind like on your background, like a bunch of books. Even the other day when we met before the interview, I asked you, are you, you at the library? Because <laughs> there are so many books behind you. <laughs> it looks like you're in a library. That's how much you read. Which is not easy when you have to travel. I mean, this, this, um, I actually have like a Kindle as well. This is just my head copy on my Kindle. I have so many more books. So like when traveling now, luckily I can still bring up some books. And yeah, you're right about traveling though. It's like when we're moving from New Zealand, I had to get rid of a lot of books because it was just so expensive to ship them over. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the things we have to keep in consideration when we are in the situation where, okay, we're living in this place, but we don't know how long we're going to stay here. We haven't figured this out yet. Even I, I don't own any book. 
like a physical copy. I don't have even pen or paper. I don't have a <laughs> like pen or paper in my place. <laughs> I write everything on my iPad. I use my iPad as a notebook and reading books and everything. So it's a way of living that is, is different from other people. The people that are, they are settling, they have their own house and their own home. Ah, yeah, true, definitely. And what do you think is the biggest upside about you leaving your country, leaving Nigeria? I think having, gaining lots of exposure to different possibilities in life, seeing things from different perspectives, meeting people from different backgrounds, different cultures. I think if I had stayed in Nigeria, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. I wouldn't have known what is possible. I wouldn't have known that I'll be able to achieve some of the things that I was able to achieve. I wouldn't have known that I will be able to maybe at some point in time in my life contribute back to to Nigeria or to different parts of the world. Yeah, which is probably the reason most people leave their country. Usually it's opportunities. Oh yeah, definitely. I think the opportunities and having hope that things are possible if you work hard enough for it and if you work smartly as well about it, I think it's very important. I think there are lots of people that are still there that are looking for that opportunity. Maybe they went to the university, they did their best, but they didn't get that opportunity because it's just not there. So being able to leave the country and knowing that if I do my own part, the opportunity will likely present itself and I'll be given the chance to be able to take on that opportunity. I think it's really valuable and something that I really appreciated. Yeah. And do you feel lucky to be an immigrant? Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel very lucky to be an immigrant because as I mentioned earlier, my story, my ability to even leave the country was just pure luck because I couldn't have done that by myself. It since just came along at a time. And I know a lot of people that I studied with, a lot of people that I know were very smart that wanted the same um, opportunity and they didn't have that opportunity. So me being able to get that opportunity and going through the experiences that I've gone through in life. Definitely feel lucky about that. This next question is a little bit tricky and let's see where it takes us. If you could go back in time, imagine you have a time machine and you could go back in time to any point in your life. When would you go and what would you say to your young self? You said to my young self, so that's assumed that I've already been given birth to. So then in that case, yeah. Yeah, unless you want to take this time travel to somewhere else. No, no, that's fine. In that case, I wouldn't really go back in time. And the reason why I wouldn't is because out of fear of changing what I have now, I think I've been extremely lucky, as I've mentioned several times, and been blessed to have the family that I have, the career, the knowledge, the people I've met along the way. So I've been very fortunate and I wouldn't like that to change by... Yeah, working on a butterfly or something changed the course of your life. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> the butterfly effect. Yeah. And after living abroad for many years, what advice would you give to the listeners that maybe wants to do the same thing you've done? I think planning along, planning long ahead usually helps mitigate some of the problems. So, for example, if you feel you want to work in a particular field, try to think of what you need to achieve that. So what type of studies you need, financial resources, how you'll get the financial resources. It's also overall helps to, I think, have a purpose in everything you're doing in life, whether if it's just, you know, you're traveling on vacation overseas, because it's Otherwise, it, it can be quite difficult to stay focused. And I've met a lot of people in my experience that immigrants like myself that I felt have lost track of what they wanted to do or the reasons why they left their countries. So I think having a long term plan and also like having a system that keeps you on track while you're going through 
those plans along the way. So you know you are still on the right path. Do you have anything else maybe we didn't cover or uh, things that you, you'd like to say? Um, I think one thing I would like to add is that Nigerians overall, like when people hear about Nigerians, like the first thing that comes to people's mind is like, you know, fraudsters and scammers and uh, so on. So this has given Nigerians around the world quite a bad um, reputation and that has also contributed to one of the main issues that Nigerians face when they want to leave the country. I guess what I want and I would like to say is it's not all Nigerians that are, you know, bad. And you hear there are over 200 million Nigerians. A very small proportion of Nigerians do all those things. And we also get affected by this thing. So whenever you meet Nigerians, give them a benefit of doubt. Yeah, you're totally right. It's not just with the Nigerian, with uh, everybody. Even Italians don't have a good reputation uh, <laughs> overseas. <laughs> not all the Italians are related with the mafia, so give it a shot. But no, you, you're totally right. There's uh, some countries, there's um, the stereotypes for some certain country are uh, not so pretty. But as you said, yeah, we should give like a fair shot to, to all the people we meet in our lives. But actually, I didn't know that Nigeria has got like a, such a bad reputation. I'd never heard of that before. It's quite common, actually. I guess I didn't know about it until I left Nigeria. And whenever like I meet people, especially being in the IT industry, people all talk about, oh, the Nigerian prince. Are you the brother of the Nigerian prince? So. <laughs> Did you find difference in different countries or that all the countries were similar? I guess in Egypt, I didn't really stay there long enough. And also because Arabic was the main language, I guess they didn't have that problem because yeah, Nigerians spoke English mainly, so they wouldn't be much targeted. In New Zealand, yeah, that's the place I heard about it a lot, uh, as well as in Australia, because I went to Australia a couple of times for work when I was in New Zealand. And yeah, in France as well, it's quite well known, at least among my colleagues at work. Okay, that's interesting. If the listeners resonate with your story and wants to get in touch with you, where people can find you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn, so... If you look for Mohammed Yakubu, you can find me there. And I've just started, created a website, uh, Mo Yakubu, so M O Y A K U B U dot com. I will be adding content to it, but uh, I think those are the best places I can be reached for now. And as usual, all the links is going to be in the show notes at immigrantslife.com. Question You just say that you started a website. I'm curious, what's the reason why you started the website? I just felt the need to share some of my knowledge, experiences, and I thought having a website will be the best way to do that in this day and age. So that's the main reason. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mo, for taking the time to share your story. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for having me. No worries. It was, uh, was my Enjoy pleasure. It. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. You can find the show notes with everything we discussed and the links to get in touch with more at immigrantslife.com slash episode 36. If you want to support the show, you can share this episode with your friends and you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Podchaser. That will help this podcast growing and helping more people. If you'd like to be my guest on the show, you can visit immigrantslife.com slash your story. Thanks again for listening. Talk to you in the next one. Ciao.